is recording started? Yes, uh, there was a chime that says recording is started. Uh, Harold is in muted for. Okay. Yeah, recording is started. Good. Okay, this is the February 22nd meeting of the WebRTC Working Group. A reminder about the IPR policy, we abide by it, and it's up there at the link. And only people and companies that are listed on the web page are allowed to make substantive contributions. During this meeting, we're going to talk about testing, media capture, WebRTC extensions, and insertable streams. So just a little info. You should have be aware of most of this. Uh, link to the slides is published on the wiki. Um, we do need a scribe. Do we have a volunteer? We have a volunteer to take minutes. Uh, can we enlist Dom or Henrik? Uh, I, I can do it. OK, thank you. All right, so here's what we're going to try to cover today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about testing, uh, then media capture, more of it to see extension stuff, and then go on to insertable streams. Hopefully, we'll get it all in within 90 minutes. So about testing. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're going to need to test going forward for some of the new work we're doing, and also how we achieve better coverage. So. What we need to test is the kind of things we'll be working on, and that's things related to peer connection, which is where we see stats, priority, DSCP. Um, we still have some of that work. We have extensions, such as where we see extensions, where we see SVC and suitable streams. Then there are extensions to capture streams and output specs. Um, and then there are some standalone specs, most of which we won't talk about because they're outside this working group. Now, uh, these, this new work offers some challenges. For example, in WebRTC stats, testing whether the stats are correct, not just whether they're retrievable, which is what we do today. For priority, DSCP, and content hints, today we just test whether attributes can be set and retrieved, not whether they actually do what they should do. For example, a text content hint should activate the AV1 content coding tools, but we do not test for anything like that today. Uh, Weber to see extensions. Uh, we don't, for example, test whether requested RTP header extensions or encryption is delivered. Um, we discovered that header encryption wasn't working the way we thought it was, uh, and that certainly was not discovered in WPT testing. Um, and then for specs like SVC and insertable streams, uh, it would be good if we could test end-to-end, -end, that is, whether content that's encoded or encrypted can actually be decrypted or decoded. Uh, but we don't do that today, certainly, in WPT tests. Uh, for media stream track and insertable streams, performance testing would be desirable if we could do it. Um, and then uh, for media capture and streams, uh, backward compatibility uh, testing. So these are some of the things that it would be good if we could do. Uh, and so we're going to chat a little bit about where we might go. So one particular harbinger of things to come uh, is the work that's been done on AV1 WebRTC integration testing. Uh, Dr. Alex Sergio have worked on developing a custom end-to-end -end test suite, which is purely for AV1 WebRTC integration testing. It is complex because it was required to demonstrate the operation of the end-to-end -end system um, so you've got these WebRTC endpoints communicating via an SFU. It's got its own RTP header extension called the dependency descriptor. Um, and so they actually had to write code on the SFU and test whether you could move up or down in the, in the uh, decode targets. Uh, and many interactions were found between the RTP stack, AV1, the header extension, scalability modes, SFU behavior, Blah, 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 blah. So it wasn't just simply testing AV1. It was the interaction with all the stuff. Um, there are JavaScript tests in progress, but they all require this SFU. 
Um, and in fact, the number of tests was so large, they had to develop an entire spec, which actually used respec to show all the test coverage. Anyway, uh, the big question was after they had done all this work to validate it, was it going to be run on an ongoing basis to guard against regression? And the answer to that seems to be no, that that is too complicated to use in a build validation test. So that is an example of all the kinds of things that we're going to be doing in the future um, and how it poses uh, challenges for testing. So here are some questions uh, that we're going to hopefully answer, at least some of which, during this discussion, which is, how do we ensure that recently added features don't regress? So, uh, you know, you check stuff in and then somebody builds an entire service on it and then it breaks. Um, and some ideas are to add server support to WPT tests. This is what there's being done in the web transport working group. Um, but we've seen, as we've seen with the AB1 N10 test suite, there are limits on what people can do for build validation. So we need to think about what the server code could look like uh, and how much coverage, additional coverage we would get. I'm going to turn it over to, I guess, Harold and Pippo. Um, to talk about the proposal uh, we're going for. So, um, so uh, the kind of experience we've had is that making big stuff happen tends to not happen. So we'd like to see if we could find some modest proposal that makes leverage. So we have a giant infrastructure at each of the browser vendors uh, development labs for testing things ahead of submit time, at submit time, after submit time, so that regressions don't sneak in. But these are all either uh, really, really cold uh, testing or they are web platform tests. And in web platform tests, there is a server component, but uh, the people who maintain that server component would like to have it as simple as possible, simply because maintaining the server is a cost in itself. So, when uh, kicking around the question of what can we build that is at, as simple as possible yet gives the maximum bang for the buck, we came up with a proposal that goes, builds really a content reflector, something that you can speak the WebRTC stack to and can reflect the data you send it. And let's stop there for a moment. and see, see whether that is going to be useful. So, FIPO came out with an actual proposal, which I will give him to talk about. Right, so we had this idea to just let the UDP packets be transferred back to the browser via WebSocket. And we were looking for a simple library to do that, and AIORTC turns out to be very well suited to the job. Also because it's already used, or AIO Quick is already used in web platform tests. So I asked Jeremy the question, how much would it take to simply terminate STUN and DTLS, decrypt SRTP, and then send the RTP and RTCP data over WebSocket? And a couple of hours later, the answer was 60 lines of code, which is really as minimal as you can get, probably. And then I wrote a simple test for that, and it basically creates a peer connection, connects a WebSocket, gets the raw packets, and then does something with those packets. And next slide, please. So here's the server. It's grown a bit bigger, but you can see it is really an endpoint. 
You have create a peer connection, which the ARRDC library can do easily. And then on receiving an offer, it will send back an answer and also monkey patch the DTLS transport to take the unencrypted RTP and RTCP packets and send them over the WebSocket. And that is all that is required in the server. Next slide, please. So if we look at the tests, they are as simple as web platform tests. You can find the code, the full code in the pull request, and it's basically creating a peer connection, creating an offer, connecting the WebSocket to the server, and then waiting for RTP and RTCP packages to arrive on that socket. In this case, I wanted a simple example, so I'm waiting for a RTP packet with a marker bit set, which tells me I have a complete frame now under some assumptions. And for simplicity, I'm going to log it using the console table function. So next slide, please. And that way, we really get two packets in this case from Chrome. And we have all the data you would commonly expect, expect from a RTP parser. Like, you get all the contributing sources. You get all the header extensions. You get a marker bit. You get whether it's, it, the packet has padding, the sequence number, synchronization source, timestamp, everything you need. And based on that, you can write the tests you want. Next slide, please. So it is a bit more complex if you want to run it in production, because it currently has offered an answer from the peer connection from the server. But in practice, the tests might want to generate the STP themselves, like a H.264 only offer should be something that the test is in control of and not the server. And thankfully, ARRTC is an ORTC library. So we could hopefully just take the ICE transport and DTLS transport and leave all the other logic in the test in JavaScript. That way, we don't have to split the logic between the server and the test. Another thing we will likely need moving forward is the ability to send packets from the test. For example, if I send an a PLI packet from the test to the browser. The browser should respond with a keyframe within the next couple of milliseconds. Or if I send a NAC, it should resend the packet with that sequence number. One of the problems we will run into is that we will likely need the ability to generate some RTCP, because otherwise the browser is not getting any response or any receiver reports. It doesn't get anything like RMB or transport CC. That means it will typically be stuck at 300 kilobits bitrate. So that is something we need to solve. But I think we can, for example, use the ability to send packets, to send RMB packets with a hard-coded value of 50 megabits per second, which should solve that problem easily. Next slide. I think those were all the slides I had. Yes. Uh, so we'd like to open it up to a little bit of discussion. Mm -hmm. What do people think? It sounds really cool. <laughs> so the main questions to address are, should we try to land this in web, in web platform tests? as a framework that uh, we can write tests on. And if we build it, will they, will they come? Will people build tests on them? Yeah, that's, that's the, the question I had. Uh, I, I like the idea. It's integrating very well with the WPT. So that seems great. Uh, the thing I like to understand is which tests or which area will, will we start testing based on that? So do we have a precise idea of which test we will write first? And we will do that. 
Well, I guess there were a few FIPO that you played with right off the bat, right? Like there was one with the uh, buy, RTCP buy. Yes, it, there's an old problem in the WebRTC org library is that it sends a buy way too often. For example, if you disable a stream via set encoding parameters, it sends a buy packet and then reuses that same SSRC. That bug has been around for years, has gotten closed a couple of times, and if we have a regression or acceptance test, it would make it easier to say this bug still exists. Other examples would be things like checking whether the mid attribute is properly set and matches the STP, and things like that. I guess those yeah. are kind of legacy or peer connection things. I guess I'd leave, leave it open to the authors of other specs like insertable streams. Harold, do you think this would be useful? Uh, the most useful part is probably going to be in the, in the testing of what actually gets to the server. And, and in the, my web platform tests, the most frustrating parts have sometimes been that when I when I do things that should cause a keyframe to be sent, mm. I can't actually check that I that that I have been sent a keyframe. And when I uh, when I do uh, do uh, layered encodings or symbol cast, I can't actually check that uh, there are multiple are multiple S uh, SSRCs coming in with different parameters. So the, and of course, and congestion control and stats. I mean, this is most useful for testing things that hit the wire, mm. where the encryption layers we have for very good reasons prevent us from simply doing packet sniffing. Yeah, I think this sounds great. And I, I hopefully, if uh, Philip and others can contribute some uh, initial tests that others can copy from, that hopefully should help a lot. I had some questions, though. Uh, the AORTC, is that able to receive simulcast, for instance? Um, well, Jeremy? I'm not hearing anything. You're muted, I think. Well, I, I think the answer would be yes, Jan Ivar, in the, uh, you'd need some of the same kind of tricks that FIPO has been using for the simulcast playground. Yes, or if we can remove the dependency on the whole STP layer in AI or RTC, we can simply send packets to the server, and the server is just echoing back the packets to the client without even knowing there's simulcast involved. So I can see if I can work on the test for that. That sounds uh, fun. I have a question. How does uh, the, the RTP traffic actually end up? On the on a web socket, is this a, a server living in the background, or, or is everything mm -hmm. hosted in JavaScript? This is a Python-based server in the uh, back end. Okay, so it it uh, it forwards the packets to the the web sockets. Yes, got it. I'm guessing data channel could also be tested, correct? Um, yes, but we would need a SCTP parser in JavaScript. Or we go the way of terminating the data channel on the server and then sending the data channel contents to the client. In this case, we might want to have SCTP parsing because 
we would like to test some HTTP wire elements. Yeah, that looks exciting to me. Yeah. If you if you find it exciting, you can write the HTTP library. <laughs> Maybe it's not that exciting. <laughs> I'm excited to actually use it. I'm not sure I will have time to. I can commit time to write a lot of tests, but um, yeah, I'm I'm fan of the the idea, and uh, it looks like a solid proposal. Let, let me just throw out. I, I, I like. I, I'm not going to do this. So obviously, like, it would up be someone who was willing to do it. But it, it almost seems like the the most wonderful thing from my point of view to use testing would be we take sort of the WebRTC library or something like that. We full we make a test client that's like not just a sort of Echoes packet server, but is like a full blown WebRTC client and negotiates everything and does everything. And it gives, but it has the added thing of it effectively has a packet filter underneath of it. Like we can grab the raw packets going in and out of it, as well as whatever data level it negotiated or whatever else. So that we can sort of, so we don't have to recreate tests that do all of the STP and everything else and all the problems with that. We already just use the WebRTC client to do that. But we get direct access to see exactly what the packets it sent and received look like on the wire. Um, that that seems like it'd be much easier to write test cases for. Obviously, it'd be a bunch more work to write the the test server. Um, random thoughts on that? Well, for example, in Chrome, there is a way to dump all the RTP and RTCP traffic to the logs, and you could extract those lines from the logs and then parse them. But I think that is harder to integrate with the test itself. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So this will also capture the RTCP, right? Yes. yes. Not in this particular version of the server, but that was right. just two additional lines. Uh, do you know how much uh, maintained is this AIO RTC uh, implementation? And, the, and it's the, including dependencies. Well, we'll see if Jeremy's microphone works, but he's a maintainer of it, and it is relatively widely used, I would say. And it has been battle tested outside of web platform tests for a while. Yeah, I guess the question is also about since a lot of the things we we'll want to use it for are new things, you know, whether it would keep up with the new stuff. Right. As an example, this, you know, the new RTP and header encryption stuff, right? Would I guess mm. well, yeah. Uh, if it's only about capturing packets, I think that makes it easier, right? It doesn't necessarily have to keep up with every feature. Mm. Yeah, if we can remove the dependency on the peer connection from that, I think that will make things much easier. Yeah, so I guess there's a few is a few questions on maybe how to get the most functionality, like what you said, next steps. Um, and maybe maybe we have a report back at the next meeting or something on how how well we're doing the next steps and what what additional things we can do. That seem reasonable. Yeah, maybe we should start uh, discussing with the WPT folks. They might need to write an RFC proposal to the WPT GitHub repo. So I don't. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should start that in parallel, since it seems there's some confidence that this will succeed from a technical point of view, and there's interest in terms of testing. So maybe we can start that as well now. OK, any other suggestions? All right, thank you. We'll move on so to I the, the, yeah. I noted the decision to, to work on landing this and talking to WPT. Folks, that yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, moving on to discussion of media capture and streams, I'm going to turn it over to Jan Ivar and you, Wen. So, Jan Ivar. All right. So, um, yes, this is uh, one of the older issues in Media Capture Main. So, we wanted to bring it up uh, for discussion. <clears throat> um, so, uh, web browsers have, uh, so this I'm first explaining uh, tainted canvas for those who are not aware. Uh, that browsers, all browsers contain some uh, cross-origin protections for media. So, for instance, if you were to, uh, and that means that you can play a me, uh, you can play and show images and videos from all kinds of different origins in a media element. So you could, for, for instance, play a, a video file here, and you can draw it to a canvas, and you can write some text on top of it. But because the source material is from a is cross-origin, basically. Uh, the canvas then becomes tainted. And I show that with a little virus symbol here. Uh, that means that uh, you can still uh, play this. You can still display this canvas on screen. But if you call get image data, you'll get a security error. And that's because the cross origin content is protected from the bits are protected from reaching the, uh, the JavaScript. <clears throat> so next slide. And I should say the reason for this, um, this tainted canvas is because uh, uh, when browsers can be, even though JavaScript itself does not have access to cookies of other sites, uh, browsers conveniently will include those cookies for other sites when you do a, a request any resource from another origin. So that's why we have to protect that data so that you know your dating side, self-image, uh, or, or or bank account check numbers are not cannot be captured by other sites, <clears throat> and because of ads. The ad ecosystem works that way. So uh, if we look at uh, video uh, element capture stream and canvas capture stream, which is two methods we have for capturing <coughs> from uh, a video element and canvas, respectively, uh, this is sort of what the spec says to do today. And uh, that means because both the video element source content and the now tainted canvas contains cross-origin information, if you try to capture them, I believe you either get black, or you might actually get, uh, this diagram might be wrong in that I think for one of them produces black, and the other one uh, might give you a security area if you try. So, uh, but I believe that just as the same is that we basically, I think there's even a recommendation that in both specs that we should protect cross-origin content by sending the equivalent of uh, muted <clears throat> and so, uh, but Firefox is a little different. If you go to the next slide. <clears throat> next, uh, yes, yeah, so Firefox, we actually have video. It's actually Moz Capture Stream. We do actually uh, support, <clears throat> on the left there, we support tainting a media stream track, which means that uh, just like the canvas, uh, there are protections on the data that if you were to try to send it over a, a peer connection or do a media recorder on it, it, you would get black, basically. But you could still, or an, or, or an error, but you can still uh, display it locally. <clears throat> so, and this diagram also shows that we could do something similar, perhaps for a Canvas Capture Stream, because it's a little odd that these two things work differently. <clears throat> so that's an idea. So next slide. So th there's basically a long-standing open issue in Media Capture from Element about this that uh, we opened that we think maybe it would be better to taint instead of mute these cross-origin tracks. Why? Uh, symmetry with tainted canvas. And I think it stems from a little bit of different back. Uh, on the back end, we felt that we sort of have internally an authorization model. We need an authorization model for media stream tracks, we felt. And that internally, we have to track the origin for a media stream track for security anyways. So that led us down this path of, of uh, tainting them instead of what the spec suggested, which was to mute um, either permanently or temporarily. <clears throat> so there's some pushback. Is this useful? And it's unclear. I mean, um, I tried to come up with some use cases for tainting. Uh, one was in the, uh, if, in the earlier slide. You'll, you would notice that uh, you could actually use this for cap for captioning, where you could then uh, draw video 
on a Quest animation frame, you could draw it to canvas every frame. Then you could draw text on top of it. And then if you wanted to show this on a lot of browsers have media element playback features like picture in picture, Chromecast, AirPlay. And you could then pipe this back into a media stream track so it could be played in a media element to take advantage of these features. Is that performant? Probably not very. Uh, is that useful? Maybe. Could it be optimized? Maybe. Other use cases might be uh, a PR identity is another reason we went down this path, because it relies on similar concepts of uh, attaching an origin to a, a piece of media. And so, but, it, but that didn't really gain a lot of success. So we're not sure if there's going to be any future consideration of that. Uh, some have mentioned media stream track manipulation features like cropping uh, that are still being suggested. And the use case here would be that such features, if implemented on a media stream track, uh, would work on cross-origin content as well versus uh, the raw media access APIs we've discussed so far would be limited to same origin data since it actually exposes the data to JavaScript. <clears throat> And the last one is, I think we're also going to talk about transferable media streams, transferring them to other uh, iframes, uh, other origins potentially, uh, which at least touches on this, but it's unclear what the security model is. Like if you transfer it to another origin, have you then effectively blessed it to be used in that other origin, or would you run up against cross-origin protections? <clears throat> um, and next slide. So long story short, there aren't that many enticing short-term use cases, but should we allow some more exploration in the space before shutting it down? So as far as media capture main, which is the main goal here is to close this issue on media capture main so that we can uh, drive this specification to rec. And so the proposal A is to basically mention the current state of things, um, and then but add a, a statement like, if the user agent supports tainted media stream tracks, then all syncs of media stream track must protect the data of cross-origin media and set tracks from being exposed to the application, for instance, by replacing the data with muted output. And the intention here would be to uh, that uh, every spec that implements a new sync for a media stream track shouldn't have to go through and look through all the specs for sources so that there's a central, uh, but they would have to normatively reference media capture main at least. So it'd be nice to say something here about uh, these protections so that things aren't implemented without these protections. Proposal B would be to try to band-aid this in media capture from element, which has a longer, uh, which is farther away from rec. Uh, and proposal C would be to say nothing and maybe open an issue on this in Media capture extensions. Thoughts? Uh, this is Yuan. Uh, I don't like proposal A. Um, I think that if we add it in media capture main, that means we would need to have two implementations. We need to show interoperability, blah, blah, blah. And so far, it doesn't seem we, we have no proof that it will be used elsewhere than in. Um, media capture from element. So uh, I would try to avoid proposal A. I'm fine with proposal B, or at least I'm fine trying to make it consistent between media capture uh, from element and media capture um, from um, media element as well. Like the two approaches should be similar, really, and they're not. Uh, until then, I would be fine with proposal B. Uh, if Mozilla think that it should be described somewhere. Uh, but I, I would track it in media capture from element, not in media capturing from now. If in the future we see that uh, origin isolation uh, is interesting for PI identity, then maybe we will integrate back the concept of tainting tracks back to media chain or back to media capture extensions. But currently, I'm not confident that this concept will be used widely. So I, I don't think we should uh, include it in media capture main. Uh, 
All right. Um, could you clarify what you meant by if we put it in Media Capture Main that we would have to uh, that that would lead to some extra testing? You said or different well, implementation. It, 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 proposal A adds a mask statement in Media Capture Main. So if we want to go to REC, we would need to show that uh, this thing is interoperable. That to implement that there are two implementations of that, and that we have good testing of what is stated in Media Stream tracks. So, um, well, I, I, to to uh, to talk to that, I think um, so. What the track concept of sources and sync allows today is that you can capture from an HTML media element that is cross origin, and you can send it on a peer connection. And where should the implementer of a peer connection look? To do they need to re normatively reference now the from element spec? <clears throat> so that's what I'm trying to avoid here. Uh, and I think a test would be that um, would actually be web compatible because the output in both cases should be black and silent. Because at the point of uh, the difference is whether uh, that happens at the source or at the sink. Right. Could the you test just be add a, like a placeholder uh, uh, internal slot? That we don't do anything useful with, but allows you know future changes to modify it. Uh, what, what are we trying to solve there? If we are trying to solve something related to media capture from element, we should track it there. Uh, with regard to media capture main, I don't think that proposal A is improving the spec. Right? Um, implementers of media capture from element will implement media capture from element. They will look at this spec. And they will see, for instance, that oh, tainted tracks can be only be consumed in HTML media elements. Oh, okay. I need to implement that, for instance. Well, but that's a different implementer potentially than the implementer of a peer connection or a media recorder. So um, the issue is, I think, that for one solution where we uh, sort of mute things at the source, yeah, that's well contained within one spec because you're not letting tainted media into the sources and sync uh, media stream track ecosystem. But if you're going to do that, then it becomes, and then it's on the sinks to basically, uh, to basically enforce that that doesn't leak. So this was more, this wasn't meant to introduce something that needed uh, testing beyond, uh, beyond mandating that uh, no new spec can we're trying to avoid to say that you know we can't ever have tainted tracks in a media stream track ecosystem in a particular user agent. So, uh, so we have a concept of tainted tracks. We are not sure we like it or we dislike it. We are not sure that it will be uh, supported in all browsers or not. Um, so, I'm not a fan of adding it. Uh, back in a spec. So currently, Media Capture Main is not uh, describing it. Um, so I would keep it that way. And I, I'm fine with a different place where we would define uh, the concept of tainted media stream tracks. And when we have consensus amongst browsers, among the web developer community, that yeah, we should really make it uh, a prime citizen, then we can either uh, put that place all the document to track uh, to going to rec, or we could merge that document in media capture main or in some other document. But uh, it's not clear to me that we have a use case for tainted tracks or uh, that we have consensus to um, build on tainted tracks in the future. All right, I'm not hearing any other uh, support for tainted tracks. So I think uh, it sounds like we're moving more towards uh, either C or B. And uh, I guess as far as Media Capture Main then, and uh, we can um, perhaps uh, transfer this issue to Media Capture Extensions. Will that work? That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. All yeah. right. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, you win. Uh, I'd like to work, to discuss other items. So, can we 
do that item as the last one of the meeting? Sure. Okay, uh, we have a few things from Henrik. Oh, right. Yes, um, so this is an old issue uh, about invalid turn, uh, turn credentials. So you, you set the credentials with the set configuration, but if it's a non-parsed error, like uh, invalid credentials, or you're unable to reach the, the host, then we don't describe where the failure should occur. So that's the problem, where, where do you surface the error? We do uh, today already have on ice candidate error, uh, which covers uh, let's see, let's see the, the stun error code. Um, sorry, I forget. So, but it doesn't cover the turn um, errors. So, my proposal here was basically to piggyback on the on ice candidate error event and say that uh, for turn turn errors uh, turn errors we also use the error code seven oh one. Um, and the alternative would be if we invent new error codes, but I'm not sure that's needed. I, I, I think this is well within the originally, uh, uh, the original reasons for creating it. Yeah, it's used as a placeholder, something is wrong. Uh, with, No one's objecting. Do we have a Seems consensus reasonable. to to merge a PR saying to use uh, error code seven hundred one? Sounds good to me. Cool. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay. So uh, this is about the Opus um, the, Opus, the Opus codec uh, in Chromium. There's uh, you can uh, achieve. Stereo by STP munging. Uh, and uh, in SDP, we have this attribute stereo equals one, and that it means that I'm okay with receiving stereo. But if the stereo line is missing, then that is implicitly the same thing as stereo equals zero, which means I pre uh, prefer to receive mono. So this attribute always talk about what you prefer to receive. However, regardless of the value of this uh, attribute, the Opus decoders must support uh, stereo. Uh, so the, the problem here is that we currently don't specify stereo, so we implicitly always ask for mono. And the current implementation in Chromium uses uh, the stereo attribute as a control mechanism for what you're sending, even though the SDP only describes what you are okay with receiving. Uh, so that seems pretty backwards. Um, and I also think that we don't look at the channel count on the media stream track. So all the problem is how should we uh, support stereo the right way? So next slide. So the proposal is to make stereo equals one uh, the default value in, in the SDP. And the way to decide how many channels to send is you should look at the tracks channel count and, uh, and the stereo attribute. So uh, if you're talking to an endpoint that doesn't support stereo and it's, it's overriding this uh, stereo one default to stereo zero, then you have an indication that they don't want stereo. So you can keep sending mono, but if everyone's okay with stereo, then you send stereo based on the media stream track property. Uh, and so this would change behavior in the case of having a multi-channel media stream track and you're just doing an offer answer exchange and not relying on the defaults, then this would start sending uh, uh, stereo. But if you want mono, then you can uh, either modify the, the answer SDP or you can just request the track with uh, channel count one or use web audio. Are you going to set the, 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 the stereo proposal in the SDP as well? 
So uh, because because not including stereo means uh, implicitly means that you don't want stereo. No, no, no. Uh, SDP you... has two attributes, right? It has it has right. Like I was wondering about the uh, not the stereo attribute, but the stereo proposal attribute. Oh, there's a stereo proposal attribute as well. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, the S prop stereo at, uh, at is is an FNTP parameter on Opus. S prop stereo. Hmm. Oh, I so I I have not looked into that. Is the answer to that? I, I, it just allows the sender to say what they what whether they're okay. likely to send stereo or not. I mean, look, it works in. I, I'm not sure hmm. it dramatically changes your proposal, but I think you need to you should use it as well to get to happen what you want. I mean, I think it helps solve your problem a little bit. Well, so I guess if so, you you have to be prepared to decode stereo regardless. So in terms of compatibility it wouldn't matter but if we if we want uh, backwards compatibility with today's behavior of defaulting to mono then uh, asking like proposing to send stereo announcing that uh, with the other attribute might make sense the, the thing i don't like about that is then the next question is how do you control what this should be set to uh, so I, I much prefer controlling it with the track because if you, then you don't have to renegotiate when you replace track. I'm thinking out loud here though. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you have to have a way to allow people to, for, like, no, regardless of what you think about, about people being able to receive stereo and Opus or not, it's true the decoder will decode it, but it doesn't mean it'll work. And it generally means that at least one, that one of those streams will be thrown away. Um, so you've got to allow people to force mono negotiation. I mean, you, you can't. Right. You can't. But uh, an endpoint, an endpoint that doesn't support uh, stereo can always reply with uh, stereo equals zero. Sure. Yep. So that would uh, that would solve that 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 uh, problem. And I think if if this is an a browser endpoint, then that doesn't support it, then certainly it should uh, overwrite it to zero. Do, do you anticipate compat issues like changing the defaults? Um, I don't, but this I have no data to back that up. This is assuming the decoders are able to handle it. It's not an issue of the coder. It's an issue of what the application does next. That's that's where things go wrong. Hmm. Usually, if if you get stereo, you and only have uh, mono output, you mix you mix it down to and uh, to a single channel. Throw it away. So just to be clear, that uh, this change would mean that browsers in a couple of months would all starting will all start sending stereo to each other if they're in true peer to peer calls. If if uh, we have multi channel media stream tracks, I. I think it by default it wouldn't have that so the yeah. why not if, if if the sender wants mono this works if the receiver wants mono what does it do if the receiver wants mono then they will do uh, stereo equals zero in the answer yeah, how, how do you make it to stereo equals zero given that that's the local description uh, but uh, it it only has an effect uh, when you're asking the other endpoint to do something, right? Because you have to be prepared. The browser has to be prepared for stereo, regardless. So yeah. setting the local uh, description, so how, how, I don't. How does the receiver cause SDP to gen be de generated that says I want to receive mono? Uh, does it need to? Because I'm, I'm thinking you could uh, you could you could set it without managing locally to stereo equals one because it doesn't have an effect, and then you before sending it over to the other endpoint you you say stereo equals zero. Well, oh, but, but, how but how do you say it? That's the point. How do you say it? And also, the spec prevents uh, does not allow set local description with a modified offer, matched offer. No, but that my point is you only need to munch it in the. If you say that, 
that apply constraints on uh, if you can do apply constraints on the on the receiver's track with uh, with channels equals one, then it, it all works. If you can't do that, I don't see how, how to set it. But um, wouldn't this only have an effect when you get it from the answer for what you're about to encode? I mean, on the answer okay. side, uh, then the attribute is nonsense you, when you set it lo locally. But on the answer side, it doesn't matter. But the answer wants to get an answer that it sends to the offerer that contains zero, zero equals zero. Yes. So in my proposal, you would have to munch it it would it would be an ugly munch but it would not be an illegal munch because you can munch it after set local description or you could say that you you set channel count you set the channel count on the on the receiver's track uh, you could do that but i i would want to avoid uh firing on negotiation needed based on apply constraints on the track seems to be some layers removed from the peer connection level. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, we don't want to apply constraints into renegotiation at all, I think. Um, yeah. I, I think the answer might be pragmatically that you control that on the sender's end. It's this idea of, um, mm. of a receiver that is not of the same origin as the sender kind of doesn't really happen that often and when it happens it's usually endpoints that are munging stp anyway is that fair yeah i i think the sender is already able to control this if the receiver really doesn't want it it can munch after set local um and if you want to properly negotiate uh, this from both endpoints, you can do this in application logic land and then leave, leave, leave it to the sender to do what you ask for. But this would mean then that browsers by default, or browsers would all start sending and receiving stereo unless an application says otherwise. Are we worried about performance and you know, low bandwidth well, um, condition? We need to have a source that's stereo. And I guess Enric pointed that currently most sources are mono. So it would be progressive, not like a, a switch that will change to stereo or all calls. That's what I've assumed, but if uh... I could try to get uh, data about that if that's not the case. Maybe we have a uh, UMA metrics for channel count. I don't know. Well, also, unfortunately, constraints do not dictate defaults, do they? So, uh, no, they don't. That's up to user agents. So, I guess if channel count defaults to one uh, on media stream tracks, then yeah, it would effectively mean. Sending mono for most applications. Yeah, I, I think this could work. And I don't see that we need to be able to set stereo equals zero on the receiver's end from the application through a uh, JS API. Yeah, I, I think it would be nice to validate that we are not, in terms of compatibility, the story is good. And in terms of uh, migration, the story is good. So if you can get some data, that would be nice. So can I write uh, as that uh, the propo proposal is fine, but only if uh, we verify that this won't cause backwards compatibility issues. So don't yeah. land the PR until uh, we have uh, some numbers. I'm not sure where, where you would get the number from. But, uh, just, I don't know. I don't know where you would get a number from, but you, you could certainly try it out by just merging in stereo equals one in a few cases and see, 
seeing if anything breaks. I mean, at, at some point, a browser will try to ship it. And I'm guessing that if it's hurting a lot of users, they will get feedback as well. <laughs> <laughs> when it gets to stable, yes. Okay, well, um, I think we can uh, enough information for this issue. Uh, okay. Possible path, but uh, more data needed. Okay, you win. Okay, um, so speaking about transferable data channel now. So um, we've heard in the past several websites doing um, their video pipeline or audio pipeline, like decoding or encoding in workers. And like Zoom, for instance, is doing it and is either using data channel in main thread or web sockets to send and to send uh, compressed data or receive compressed data. There are over uh, websites like uh, Parsec for game streaming remote desktop that are doing similar things. Um, Generally, the web with off-screen canvas and so on is uh, uh, adding more and more features to process audio and video in um, background threads for workers. And while for um, trans um, for transform, like for um, WebSocket or HTTP, we already have support uh, in workers for doing HTTP or WebSocket. It's not the case for data channels. In the past, we discussed the feasibility of uh, creating data channels in workers, particularly in service workers. But maybe we can uh, reduce the scope here of the problem and um, solve existing issues on existing websites. And the idea of uh, the solution for websites like Zoom or Parsec would be to create data channels as we do it today. So you create a peer connection in in a window environment, you negotiate and so on. And at some point, you have a data channel object that you send to the worker. And in the worker, you will receive uh, messages, you will send messages, um, and potentially all this network flow will be of the main thread. So we reduce the scope and we hope it will be simpler. Um, so some some issues that will not be solved if is if for instance you want a persistent data channel like you're navigating from one page to the other same origin uh, same service worker and you would like to keep the data channel alive so this proposal is not uh, a solution for that but still we think that uh, what we provide with transferable data channel might still be uh, a good opportunity for, for websites next slide so what I did was looking at what is needed to make data channel transfer, uh, transferable. Um, so in terms of what would be new to specification, we would need to uh, specify a transfer algorithm. So given a data channel is just a pipe, a readable and writable stream plus some more events, it would be very similar to what streams working group define, for instance, for transferable streams. Um, so it, it would not be that difficult. Uh, we would need to define what a neutered data channel is, because we probably don't want uh, the data channel to be uh, usable in both ends. So there's, there's some work that needs to be done there. Um, in terms of existing spec, when I looked at it, um, a lot of what is in the spec would not need to be changed, like creating closing algorithms, uh, method definition, uh, garbage collection as well. So I do not anticipate like a large refactoring of the current spec. In terms of implementation, uh, I just looked at the code, so maybe I'm wrong, but it, basing on the WebRTC.org code base, uh, it doesn't seem very difficult to uh, allow processing of data channel in a worker without hitting main thread. So it should be feasible to go directly from network thread where we're receiving packets to the worker thread where we're actually processing the data, which would be the optimal um, path. Next slide. 
so my temporary conclusion from looking at this space is that uh, first, transferring data channels can help existing web applications. And uh, it is something that the web is embracing, doing more stuff in workers and providing more primitives in workers, like off in CADVAS, for instance. And uh, the complexity in terms of implementation and specification is much reduced um, compared to creating data channel in workers. Um, there's one alternative to this proposal, uh, which is to apply WebSocket streams to RTC data channel. And then you have RTC readable stream and writable stream gators instead of events. And you can piggyback on transferable streams to transfer them to, um, to workers as well. Um, I still think that transferring data channels is, uh, is somehow better. It's it's more natural and it makes it it makes it a little bit more on, on par with web sockets as well. So and I don't think it will be any more difficult to implement or to specify on the contrary. So um my question to the working group is whether there's interest in both defining and implementing transferable data channels. Um on our side we think it would be a valuable uh, effort. Thoughts? Uh, I think there are a number of applications that would use this if it were available. So I also agree with the, that we should do one or the other. Um, uh, the alternative sounds a little appealing too. So if just to making sure I understand to so the the if we disregard the alternative, you're not proposing any uh changes to the API. Go ahead and back up stream. Yeah. Uh I'm, 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 I'm just proposing that we, we make the data channel object transferable. That's the only thing right. I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no no new constructor, no new thing, except for that. So the advantage of that would be that it, it would probably be easier to do, and we'd get it quicker. But it would have the same event-based um, API that we, we're accustomed to. Um, so I think the, the, the only counter argument I see is <laughs> your alternative also sounds appealing to me as an alternate approach. Because it sounds like if data channel had already supported readable, writable streams, then we sort of could have already done this by, without making data channels themselves transferable. We could basically just pipe it to another transferable, uh, another transform stream that you then transfer uh, to a worker. And it would work that way. And browsers, in theory, would optimize a way the main thread? Is that fair? Um, hopefully, yes. In most cases, if the application is uh, is taking care enough of that, then I believe that uh, browsers will be able to optimize it. They will not be able to optimize it, or they will have they might have some difficulties optimizing it in all cases. But that that would be fine. Um, I don't know where is the WebSocket Streams proposal. If it was shipping already in a, in a browser, and like in all browsers, I would say, yeah, we already have it. So why not piggybacking on it? Uh, now, I think that transferable might be a little bit faster and will give us like all the benefits. So that, that's why I'm just suggesting it instead of uh, the WebSocket Stream. Um, proposal. But if people in the working group think we should go with WebSocket Stream, uh, I'm also happy to discuss this approach. Yeah, I, I personally like the, the simpler proposal, because um, I think there's a lot of code written to data the existing data channel API that would use it immediately. So you'll, you'll basically get a lot of usage quickly. Um, I do, I do see some implementation hardships. 
just because uh, you then have two objects that both are connected to a to a to the same uh, network connection. Uh, you have the SATP transport object that lives together with the pair connection, and you have this data channel object that has moved into another context. Especially when you when you move this across processes, it gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah, I was assuming, I was assuming you'd have to move both. Uh, um, no. no, no. I think I think we should just keep one. And uh, it's true that I, I believe that at, at least in terms of implementation, if you're just uh, transferring it to worker, it should be simple to optimize and it should work. Uh, it, it should be fairly easy to implement. If you're yes. doing out of process. Exactly. Well, yeah, we'll need to add a copy. For, for, out, of add process, a copy. for out of process, uh, you will you will need to yeah you will need to copy uh, data or use uh, shared memory which is also something feasible um, i believe that uh, you you have whether you use readable stream writable stream or transferable you have the same issue in any case um, i was thinking that we could start with uh, just dedicated dedicated worker because that's the major uh, driving scenario and we could also uh, um, study um, out of process um, transferable data channels, which I guess would be iframe to iframe, basically. And uh, that's something I could prototype, for instance, and report whether that's difficult. I do not anticipate any difficulty, honestly, except that it will be less efficient. Uh, but yeah, sure, it's not the same process. So, and you need to get the data from the network, process CTP, which is usually in a process, and then you would do process processing of this data, this part data in another process. So in any case, you will have a, a birth penalty. By the way, WebSocket Stream has an origin trial that uh, seems to have ended in, uh, in uh, some something like a 80, uh, m87 and it did not make m89 and i don't see any sign of it in, in 92 either mm. so okay so what, what you're saying right. is that probably websocket stream is dead somehow well it's uh, uh Resi's, uh note of 10 days ago was i'm making progress on the standard but it's slower than i'd like i will push it to a later milestone so I would say heavy, heavy going, still not done. Well, I think it might also be overtaken by web transport in some respects. Right, right. Um, for, some, for some use cases, probably. <clears throat> and if if right. we if we had managed to to do the do the thing that uh, does the uh, let's uh, web web uh, socket. Let let a dot data channel produce a stream of streams. That would be also be a solution that could be transferred. Right. But at the moment, I I like UN's proposal. It seems somewhat straightforward if he thinks that he can manage the 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 cross uh, pro, cross process issue without yeah. too much. Problem. I, I yeah, think it might be worth exploring. Cross, yeah. Yeah. Just for the cross process thing. Uh, the ugly thing would be to say we're only allowing dedicated workers uh, mm -hmm. post messaging transfer transferring to dedicated workers that's something we could define but it's really ugly and i don't know of any uh api in the web that is doing it so that's why i'm mm -hmm. saying we we should at least try to do it and see whether that's very hard or not uh, i would guess share the labor for so one example mm. I think the main reason I would support that would be that it probably blocking on WebSocket stream is probably would make this take a lot longer. And I also happen to know there's uh, I've been working on polyfilling WebSocket stream on top of web transport actually, and uh, it's a bit of an impotence uh, mismatch because <clears throat> both WebSocket and data channels operate on messages 
of uh, arbitrary length, which doesn't really fit readable writable stream directly. So you end up with a stream of streams concept. So um, it might be, you know, the alternative might take a lot longer to get right, even if it's not um, directly, if, even if it doesn't end up directly mapping to WebSocket stream, the idea of having an RTC data channel with a readable writable sounds <clears throat> desirable long term, but it's still not clear how that fits with its inherent uh, message based uh, uh, transport. So, yeah. I think it's yeah, worth exploring uh, transferring an RTC data channel as is. Yeah. Okay. Um, what so, the so, so it seems that there's interest and that we should try to study it or maybe prototype it. Um, okay. I think I think prototyping will be very useful. Yeah. I mean, particularly because uh, one of the a bunch of the use cases here involve high volumes of data transfer. So the copy issue is going to be a problem. If it's, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's worth what I think. Okay. Data channels don't work at many megabits per second anyway. Okay. Um, so issue 48, exposed RTC transforming workers. So at last meeting, uh, we discussed the uh, transform attribute on sender and receiver, which is a way to set, hey, I, I want to do a transform. Um, it's all in window environment, and there's a need to complement that when you're setting a script transform uh, on how it will happen to be executed in the worker. So there are, there are a few uh, decisions that we could make on the shape of the API. The first one is we are doing something in uh, in a window environment, which is say, hey, this transform is now a strict transform, and the script transform should run on the worker. That's the first, the fourth line there, send a transform equal new script transform worker. Then we need something to happen in the worker to say, hey, there's a, there's a transform, there's a new transform, uh, so worker, please start to do something. Uh, so on the slide, there are like two examples. One is an event-based variant where every time you create a new script transform for a given worker, then you have uh, an RTC transform event that is fired, and then you can get uh, a transformer, which will be the pendant of the transform but in the work environment, and you start doing things. Uh, the other variant, which is uh, on the right of the slide, is based on audio worklet so you have you you create your class which extends as a script transformer and then you register uh, this class and then every time you create a transform then what what the worker will do is creating a, your my transform object um, it's working well because it's used in worklets um, but it's a little bit uh, there's more api and so my proposal here would be to start with an RTC transform event. Um, so I don't know whether we should, I, I, I will go for the slides and maybe we can get back to this uh, discussion topic to get feedback from the working group. So next slide. So now let's say that we have a transformer either from uh, the audio worklet or from the RTC transform event. Now we need to get to the data. And I listed, I listed three different options. Um, the first option is that, uh, let's say we have a transform, RTC transform event there. Then we, we say, hey, this event has a dictionary which is called RTC transform event data. And it has two fields, readable and writable, and also options. Uh, and the options is actually given uh, as input from the window environment uh, at the C script transform constructor. It's a minimal API. Uh, it should be sufficient. So that's the first option. Uh, next slide. So the option two 
instead of having a dictionary, we use an object. So we create an interface. So a real, so RTC script transformer will, would be a real interface. We would keep readable, writable, and options there as our read-only attributes. Um, so it's more work since you will need to describe this script transformer, but it's also makes things much easier to expose additional API surface, like more state getters, like uh, am, I, am I in a sender, in a receiver? What's the bit rate? Uh, in the case I need to request a keyframe, then we could add a method uh, to the script transformer object as well. So it makes things more extensible and easier to manage as well. So that's option two, but we would keep readable and writable there. And the option three is we would, so next slide, we would go with still a script transformer as an object, but this time we would try to avoid using readable and writable. And there are a number of ways we could do that. Uh, we could add an event like on frame event and then an NQ attribute. We could use um, a callback like, uh, so transform streams has a transformer transform callback and we could try to allow JavaScript in a worker to set that callback and uh, do, do things like that. Um, that's feasible as well. Compared to option two, we, we keep the same uh, extensi extensibility and I believe option two and three are sort of shimmable one with the other anyway. So it's not like, uh, um, like the, yeah, it's, it's a decision we need to make at some point, but it, they are sort of similar. So next slide, which is trying to uh, conclude uh, this um, issue. So the first thing we need to decide is whether we want something like an RTC transform event to notify the worker that there's a new transformer that he needs to deal with or whether we want something like audio worklet where you register something for a dedicated API or whether we want something totally new. Um, the second decision we need to make is whether we prefer to expose a dictionary or an interface. Uh, I believe an interface is more extensible, so that's why I would go with a script transformer interface. And the first uh, decision I'd like us to make is whether we prefer readable, writable, or even post method. Uh, and my proposal here would be to stick with readable, writable stream for now. Uh, there are some pros and cons, so it's worth keeping in mind that we can uh, continue investigating that and if we find something better than that, we can certainly uh, change uh, the API. But if we do not find anything, we could still stick with readable, writable. Uh, thoughts? Well, the, the first one is that um, I don't think a dictionary can be an attribute. So in your solution one, that is actually not uh, valid What by the L. Because you have read-only attribute RTC transform event data transformer, which is a dictionary, and I don't think that's uh, allowed hmm. because uh, dictionaries are inherently uh, use they inherently use copy semantics, so they cannot you cannot have a reference to it such as an attribute. An attribute cannot re return copy semantics, so the transform so, yeah. would have to be like a method that returned the dictionary. So, so the thing that I like, kind of liked about uh, option one, as written, was that it was almost line for line identical with what the code that is currently in the examples for uh, insertable streams, uh, except that uh, the messages uh, in the examples are completely ad hoc. So. I keep harping on the feedback messages, which is that, that, that uh, in order in order to complete the loop, we'll have to get to a four-line version of readable, writable, readable control, writable control, 
but uh, having a, a standard form, standard message that standardized message that they use for this instead of doing an ad hoc message would make life, life a little simpler, especially if you can have a an a standardized message that includes an any. I don't know how how easy that is to implement. Yeah, post message takes an any and is creating uh, an event which carries this data. So it's it's certainly feasible to to do it. Uh, may, maybe we can start also with the first decision. Um, the first decision is, do, do we like the RTC transform event, for instance? I don't see how much it buys me, but uh, I, don't, I don't see it as a huge difference either. So from what I understand, it seems that we would be fine with an RTC transform event. And uh, if we go to the last slide, so I'm not I had a question clear. about that. OK, yeah. When exactly would that event fire and how many times? So uh, go to. So yeah, whenever you create the new RTCP script transform, you uh, provide a worker. So the first thing you would do in that uh, constructor would be to enqueue a task in the worker uh, event loop. And uh, you will um, get the uh, options and serialize it and blah, blah, blah. And then you will uh, fire the event in the worker even loop. So it, it's happening once per uh, created RTC RTP script transform object. Okay, so it's a one time one time event. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that event sounds reasonable, um, unless there's other ways that are common in workers to do similar things. The um, the thing I found was uh, the worklet where you register a uh, transformer and so on. Uh, mm. That's what is implemented currently in Safari. Uh, I did it because it's what was in work in worklets for uh, audio uh, processor. But right. uh, honestly, it's it looks like it's uh, a little bit too much in terms of the API surface. So I that's why I prefer the transform even which is. Uh, Lighter. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I think I, I share your concern there. So. But I should probably ask others. So, okay. Is there consensus that we write a PR? for uh, the RTC transform event? Yep, that's better. OK. Um, so getting back to expose dictionary or interface. Uh, so if I understand correctly, Harald, you would, you would be more in favor of, of dictionary than interface? Or am I misunderstanding things? Well. Uh... My experience is, is is that if we want a dictionary, you have to, as you, as Janira says, it's a copy, but it's it's a pass by value. A message is inherently passed by value anyway. So if you so if you want to have a have a dictionary out of it, you just de define a getter that returns a dictionary and no how no forward. Uh, I would defer to Janira on. Uh, on whether that should be a dictionary interface. We have flipped back and forth so many times on so many interfaces. 
<laughs> over the years, but I'm still not sure which one is the best one for each purpose. Okay, um, yeah. I guess I can start with uh, with an interface. I personally prefer an interface since uh, I, I feel like we will need some extension points. So maybe it will be for, for field values that you're mentioning, Harald. Maybe it will be methods. Um, so I, I, I feel more confident with a, a transformer interface personally. Yeah, that works for me. That's a good. Uh, that's as good good an argument as any. Okay. Let's go. And uh, about sticking with readable stream, writable stream for now, at least. Is that good with everybody? I prefer to stick with read readable stream and writable stream. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I will uh, do have to pull request. Um, <laughs> On uh, web obscene searchable streams uh, based on uh, what we've been talking about. Okay. All right. We didn't get through everything, uh, but uh, we did get through what we talked about. So uh, thank you, everybody. And we will post the minutes and recording as usual. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Everyone. Bye.